Uh, welcome everyone to our second of the MRC uh, symposium talks for the semester. And so I'm very excited to have uh, Professor Hannah Stewart here from UC Berkeley. And so uh, Professor Hannah Stewart is the Don M. Cunningham Assistant Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UC Berkeley. And uh, some notables, so she graduated with her master's and PhD from Stanford University. She actually did her BS not too far from here at uh, GW. And so she's familiar with the, uh, you know, the, M the DMV area. Uh, and then also she's won a number of recent awards. So we have uh, the NASA Early Career Award. Uh, as well as the Johnson & Johnson Women in STEM 2D uh, Award. And so with that, I'm going to let her uh, talk about embodied dexterity. Great. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here today, and I'm really glad that there's a group here really excited to hear about embodied dexterity. So go, please ask your questions. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing them. So I, uh, I was a little tired when I made the title. It's a bit long. It's a bit to, to read. So I'm going to offer actually a much shorter title, um, and it's just the design for robots in contact. So that's really the theme of this entire body of work that I'm going to show you. Um, and uh, just for a little bit of context, I've been a faculty member for uh, almost five years. Um, and the, a good portion of this was during the pandemic. Um, what you're going to see today is a breadth of really exciting newer projects. I'm going to really focus on the things that we've started since I began as a faculty member. Um, and really, it's, it's very exciting that these are coming out now. I'm going to not dive really deep into any single one. And so just know that I'm going to be posting you know, student names. And you're always welcome to follow up with us and check out the, the publications, which will have a lot more detail. OK, so um, before diving in, I want to just acknowledge the incredible group of researchers who are doing this work day to day. Here you can see the uh, pictures of the postdocs and uh, PhD students. And then there's also undergraduate students, uh, an army of undergrads who are supporting this as well. Um, and then also the, the funding sources that have supported this work. Now, for today, I'm going to be focusing mostly on our remote robotics applications or autonomous robotics applications, which has been largely supported by uh, fellowships through NSF and the Department of Defense as well as NASA, um, especially the Early Career Faculty Award. OK, so what does the Embodied Dexterity Group do? We work on robots. And robots, we know, have embodiment as well as intelligence. So we're really trying to think about design at the intersection of those things. And we add in contact. So we want to know how the design of these systems is going to make them intelligent and able to respond to variations in contact conditions. Now, I trained uh, in my PhD under Professor Mark Akoski at Stanford. Um, and he has this really nice quote that I just I love, and I think it kind of captures what we're going for. Like the performance of sports cars, or a sports car, which is ultimately limited by the tires on its wheels, the performance of a robotic hand is limited by the skin on its fingers. And so because we are thinking about robots in contact, this is often relegated to hands and fingers. Um, but it could be anywhere on the body. Um, but hands are going to be a common theme, and skin is going to be a common theme throughout this talk. OK. Um, so if we start thinking about robot hands um, in this context, there's a couple sort of uh, main um, features that are going to be really important. And, and one other theme is that we want these robots to go out in the world. We want them to be in unstructured environments. Oftentimes in um, highly unstructured environments, we want to be soft. You want to have some sort of underactuation, and this can make you more resilient and more adaptable to different circumstances. Okay, so we're talking about soft robotic rivers. Now, there's um, a couple things that come up. A lot of work is done in terms of how we design these compliant elements. Are they more soft? Are they more stiff? How do we decide the degrees of freedom? And as you can see in this animation here, we have two almost identical hands, except that the stiffnesses of the joints are mixed up. And this is an underactuated finger. And it really very much is going to influence the function of this robotic device. Okay, So that's sort of the, the kinematic and compliance design. But what's often not quite um, as studied is the impact of friction. And I think this is going to be very intuitive. But in this animation, you can see that the very slippery object gets pushed out of the hand, and the frictional object becomes a stable grasp. Now, the object is going to contribute to that contact condition, but so will the design of the skin. And we might be able to add in sensors to compensate for changes in that contact condition. So that's going to be uh, where a lot of our work also lies. 
Okay, so this is just to give you an overview of the works across this entire space, and so we've got things contributing in different areas. So we're going to kind of take a journey through some of this. I'm going to start with just giving you a quick introduction on my thesis work um, from five, six years ago um, to kind of orient you uh, from my, my own lens. But then we're going to quickly shoot across to talk about um, skin and contact conditions, specifically thinking about suction and lubrication. And then from there, we're going to emanate out and start talking about what I call unconventional tactile sensors, new modes of tactile sensing that, that are, haven't been necessarily explored before. And then we're going to start talking about field applications and, and look at one case study with tethers. And then finally, we'll finish up with granular media. So hold on. <laughs> Here we go. Um, OK, so uh, I got my start looking at the design of humanoid hands for this deep sea diving robot. It's called Ocean One. Um, and it's been out for a couple years now. Here you can see 2016. Um, and I, this work had been going for a couple years before then. Um, and the director of this project was Professor Osama Khatib. So I designed and built and fabricated the hands for this robot. And it was super cool because it didn't break. We took it to the Mediterranean and it actually was able to grab some stuff. And one of the coolest things was we got it to dive down to 91 meters to a shipwreck. And it was actually able to grab onto a, a base that hadn't been touched in many centuries um, and actually acquire it and bring it back. So you can kind of see in the image here, it's, it's grasping onto that, that base. OK, so my background actually started first with that kinematic and compliance question. OK, so if we have an underactuated hand, meaning you've got fewer actuators than you have degrees of freedom, and in fact, you can kind of see this in your own hand, when you try to actuate your finger, more, multiple joints curl. But then when you wrap your hand around the middle joint, you get a different behavior, right? So that's the same action with two different motions. So in some ways, our hands are also underactuated. Um, but yeah, so here's the various compliance simplified diagram of how this works. And we uh, explored a couple interesting features. Um, in particular, you can see the, um, the set of springs down here. That's going to sort of dictate how much load sharing you have between your fingers. Um, and one of the key takeaways of this work is we found that in comparing different transmissions, that transmission I just showed you, you get different outcomes in strength based on the object you're grasping. And one of our major sort of empirical observations was that we wanted this transmission to either be very, very stiff or very, very soft. And the intermediate stiffness wasn't giving us much functional outcome. And so you can have just a single binary um, variable stiffness transmission to grasp a lot of objects. And we had some interesting mechanical design around how we could implement this very robustly for the field. If you're interested, go check it out. Um, and also, we, we have recently submitted a um, Oh, sorry, we released an open source version of this, which is really easy to, to 3D print on just like really cheap 3D printers. So if you want to try and fabricate it yourself, feel free, have at it, modify the design. Um, I think it's fairly easy to put together. It's kind of like an IKEA um, type uh, uh, documentation that a student uh, did a really nice job putting together. Okay, so let's step away from this sort of kinematic compliance discussion, because I think a lot of people are thinking about this and doing really good work in it. What's less well thought about is the impact of your environment, right? So a lot of times in, in underwater applications, what you do is you take a, a really good robot that was designed for land, you work really hard to waterproof it and make sure it's going to be robust underwater, and then you, you toss it underwater. Never, not in that design process do you see a, stop, a, a situation where you stop and say, hey, this is going to be underwater. Should our robot look significantly different than it did when it was on land? So that's really the fundamental question that we're trying to peel apart. And, uh, and you'll see some sort of case studies of how we're, we're thinking about this. And really the main difference here is we've got density, we've got viscosity, and we've got slippery films that might not be present in air. OK, so when we started thinking about grasping underwater, one of the best underwater graspers is a fish. This is a suction flow mechanism. So you open your mouth, you suck in a bunch of water, and in with it comes the prey. This is not something you see on land. Okay, You don't just go up to your spaghetti and like, like try to suck, <laughs> suck it off the plate. No, you use a fork, right? You touch it physically. Um, in this case, we are using the, the ambient fluid to help us with the capture of our prey. Um, and uh, actually, there is one example of this on land. It might be an elephant. But then you've got huge lungs, and maybe you're able to pull a potato chip. right? So the scaling just doesn't quite work the same on, in air. 
Okay, so what does this look like for an underwater hand? Well, we took essentially the Ocean One hand and tried applying suction to it to explore this space. Um, and so here you can see the force profile. We're talking about one Newton, a little bit more than one Newton, maximum pressure as we're touching the surface. And then as we pull the object away from the surface, within one or two millimeters, the forces are getting quite small. So this is a really gentle suction flow. We're not like pulling a vacuum like crazy hard. We're just adding these tiny little centrifugal pumps that you would get for like your aquarium. And it's just like very gently kind of pulling water in. And so this is actually the very first take, just tossed a little neutrally buoyant Lego block in there and it captured it. So that hopefully is reminiscent to sort of the ease that a large fish could hopefully capture its own prey. Okay, so that's maybe obvious. So now the question is what about larger and more massive objects? Um, and does this manipulation of, of sort of the forces of the contact uh, help? So this is an object that's one order of magnitude more massive. It's also quite a bit larger. And you can see that in this case, without suction, we have no hope of grasping the object, but with suction, we do. Um, and so, of course, we want to try to extrapolate this to other sorts of systems, and, and so we want to be able to model what's going on. And so these lines are different models that we've tried. The red is without object drag. The blue solid line is with object drag. So actually grasping a floating object underwater might be a little easier than if you're out in space. Um, and these dots are our experimental trials. So that blue line is matching pretty darn well with the experimental trials that we've got in here. And then the blue dashes are with suction flow. And this is just a very simple distance model, um, like the one I showed on the previous slide. And we get an increase in our grasp region by about over 30%. So that's pretty good. And this star is the trial with the tube you just saw. Um, so this is what we would call the grasp region. Okay, we did a whole bunch of other modeling and stuff, um, uh, but I want to move on. So the other thing that we, we started to encounter were slippery films. I actually got a chance to hold this object, and it felt like a bar of soap that had been sitting in water for a long time. So this is like, like I'm like really worried about dropping it, okay? So um, how can we handle this? Well, suction flow can help here as well. You get a benefit because you get an increase in your normal force, right? You're actually kind of squeezing the surface harder. But we also found that we get an increase in our coefficient of friction. Okay, so it's not just more normal force, it's also an increase in that coefficient, which is pretty neat. And it's more so on rough surfaces because you still get a little bit of flow there. Um, and then of course we can play with this and reverse the flow. And you can find, see that uh, for a very squishy object where the grasp would go unstable, a little bit of pushing on the object at the fingertip can help to grasp it. So we're really playing with this normal force, both positive and negative, um, in order to generate new manipulations. Okay, so that was my start. And now I wanna go into some of the newer projects um, in the lab. So one thing, as we started going into you know, skin design and you know, contacts underwater, this theme that kept emerging was, well, people have wrinkly fingertips when they're in water. And um, when we started sort of consuming this literature, a lot of it is driven by biological studies, actually looking at like real people with wrinkly skin and seeing if there's some sort of functional benefit. There's still actually a little bit of a hot debate, at least in my opinion. Some people do sort of tribological studies where they load it very specifically. And they might find that there's not a benefit. Actually, you might get less friction if you've got wrinkly fingers. But then there will be like a functional test where people have to manipulate objects and they seem to do better with wrinkly fingers. So, I, you know, TBD. Um, but uh, this is what motivated us to maybe think of this not from the biological perspective, but from the engineering design perspective. So, we've got treads on tires, we've got treads on shoes. If we go sort of one magnitude smaller, doesn't make sense to have treads on fingers. So we put a variety of different skins onto the fingertips of this Roboteak gripper. Um, and you can see here that we've got one feature and then three features, and then we're moving it up to 55 features. And we're keeping the nominal surface area uh, consistent throughout. And you can see that we get maximum friction conditions with three features. This is not something you see on most robot hands. You often see smooth flat, and this is going to maximize sort of the stickiness, the maximum friction you can get in a dry, clean circumstance, right? Because then you're gonna have to peel off the surface. Now it's gonna be less predictable. 
So a lot of times people will texture the surface so that failure happens at the same force every time, even if it's lower. Not many people kind of go in the middle. So we wanted to start to understand what's going on with the lubricating films, because that's ultimately what's driving this. Um, and so we developed a way to visualize this using um, FTIR. Now, um, FTIR works because you have light trapped in a plate. If you put a drop of something that lets that, or, or some sort of contact that lets the light disseminate, you're going to get a brightness by looking up at the bottom. So you can see the camera down here looking upward. Now, if you put a droplet of water on there, you're going to get a bright spot. So you can't just put water on your plate. Um, and so this student found that a, um, a dye that has a very similar index of refraction as the plate surface, as well as using it um, with color, allows you to start to visualize the thickness of that plate and dif uh, the film and differentiate that from the actual area of contact. Um, and so that's what this is explaining. Now you can see what this looks like. So in the dry circumstance, you get behaviors that are the classic stick-slip behavior that you would expect for uh, rubber on, on something like acrylic. Now in the wet circumstance, this single one is basically like sliding off with almost no, no effort whatsoever. It was so hard to get it to stay. But on the, um, on the three, you can see that it's actually sticking to the surface, and then we're starting to get the stick-slip behavior that we would see in dry. So that's, that's pretty cool. Now, this is as far as we've gotten on this project, but there's more to do to really understand that effect of the thin films. All right, so we've talked about compliance, and we've talked about contact underwater. But the last element of this is intelligence. Okay, We need to have some sort of sense of touch so we can respond to what's going on. And so staying with this theme of underwater suction and, and uh, so forth, we have one demo here where a fingertip is going to come into the surface, it's going to sort of move along it, and we're trying to relate the angle of that fingertip with the surface to the amount of suction flow that's going through. So you can imagine if you're, you're sucking water through and something clogs it, it's going to stop flowing. And you could measure that flow anywhere along the suction line. So here you can see the differential flow measurement, um, differential pressure measurement, which is giving us an estimate of flow. Um, the interesting thing is we get this cool stick-slip behavior sort of amplified by the fluid having to accelerate and decelerate through the tube. And then as we come down and then pop off, you can see once again it's sort of a dynamic um, amplification of that feature. But yeah, so we're able to kind of get a sense of what's going on. Now what if this surface was a little porous, right? We wouldn't ever get to this closed clogged circumstance? What if we were misaligned a little bit? So now we have maybe a useful sensor. It's really easy to integrate if you have this tubing system already installed, but how do you make sense of it? Okay, um, and so one thing that you might be able to do is incorporate this into known haptic procedures, which is just basically a behavior that you're implementing in a repeatable fashion so that you can get the information you want. And so on the left-hand side, let's assume that we know that we are grasping or pinching an object in free space. We can palpate it or squeeze it like this and kind of rotate it. And so that's what's shown on the left-hand side, and we're able to see a difference in the signals between the very soft, squishy object and the very hard, rigid plastic object. And then on the right-hand side, we're just pulling tubes out of the hand, and we're actually able to do sort of a, a, a predictive estimate of how much force we're applying, let's say for applications where you don't want to put an expensive load cell on it. Okay, so this is the, the takeaway of this technology, which is really thinking about the system that you have and when you're manipulating contact in order to do better grasping or manipulation, you're often doing something that can be measured. Okay, And in this case, it's suction. Right? So we're doing something in order to sort of pull objects in. And that also, at the same time, gives us a measure that we can uh, listen to and try to understand what's going on. It's also important to note that this technology, the sensing technology, has no electronics at the end effector, which has a real benefit. Um, and so if the pump is up at the shoulder, your sensor could also be up at the shoulder. So that's pretty cool. Because right now, a lot of hands are designed with tactile sensors. Very few hands in the field have tactile sensors. Um, and just in case you don't know, tactile sensor is just like a sense of touch. Um, for robots and for artificial um, applications. Okay. So that, I think, is the 
end of the underwater stuff, because I know not everybody, there, there's actually quite a strong uh, underwater um, research here, um, but not everybody does this. And so I wanted to take a step back and look at some other environments. So first, we're going to look at air. And you know, when we're talking about flow and how it makes so much sense underwater, a really natural question would be, well, are you going to get the same benefits of some of these mechanisms in air, and does that translate to my application in air? So um, in the closest sort of analog to this suction tactile sensing, we wanted to um, think about an application where it might make sense in air. Suction cups are really great. They are used in a lot of industrial applications. Um, they're very cheap, very easy to integrate. They're like everywhere. Um, but the, the reason why they work is because they seal onto a surface. And so if they pop off, they're going to have maximum flow. And if they're engaged, they're going to have no flow. So there's very, it's just, it's a highly, highly sensitive system to that seal breakage, right? And so how do you measure sort of that intermediate flow, which was so easy to measure underwater? Well, what we decided to do was actually to measure internal flows. So even though the, the external flow might be sort of binary, um, you might get internal flow inside, okay? So if it's wiggling around, air might be going left and right. And so we, what we have is this, um, these four internal chambers. Um, what's happening here is the vacuum line. There's only a single vacuum line to the whole cup. And then you've, you're measuring wall pressure around these four, uh, these four chambers. Okay. So once again, we're getting sort of a flow estimate with a pressure transducer. So these are really cheap, a couple of bucks. Um, and so this total sensing system is, is very, very cheap. And we've got a single casting process for the cup. OK, so how do we actually now start to make sense of this? Well, so first what we wanted to do was just see, like, can we tell where a seal breaks? Okay, so if we have just a really fast binary signal, we don't know where around the cup it failed. And so that can't really inform our next grasping location. Um, and so here we're just peeling it off. And you can see that there's a single uh, location in which we're getting that first failure. And so what we do is we visualize this. We get an estimate using FTIR of the, co the real contacts um, and are able to identify where that seal is breaking. Now, how does this signal actually work? What's going to happen, and you can see this in the top diagram here, is for a seal break along this direction, flow is actually going to shoot across, and maximum flow is going to happen in the opposite chamber. Um, and you can see this happening here, where the seal break is here, and maximum flow change is in 4, which is the purple line, which is down here at the bottom. Okay. Um, and oh, I don't show this, but we were able to do sort of a, a prediction of where and when that failure was going to occur. We collaborated with Professor Ken Goldberg, and they did some uh, long, short-term memory uh, machine learning, and were able to do that prediction. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and now, okay, so that's, that's sort of the binary signal and how we start to get more resolution spatially. Um, but it turns out that there's a lot of surfaces that will induce that intermediate flow regime. Um, and so here what we see is a two pieces of acrylic. One is very rough, like what you would see like on, in a bathroom so you can't look through. And the other side is very smooth. Um, and here you can see the sort of just the average across all four chambers. When we go onto the rough surface, we get partial suction engagement. And when we go onto the smooth surface, we get full suction engagement. Now, to enable this, we've had to actually reduce the pressure that we're pulling, right? Because if you've got a suction cup, it'll you know, suck onto a surface, and then you won't be able to move it, and then it'll like pop off and do some, something weird or fold over. So we've reduced the flow, so we're just gently sucking onto the surface, and we're able to do haptic exploration onto that surface in order to gain more information. Uh, and this is just a still image showing that, that plot over time. OK, so this once again leads us to this question, though, of like, OK, how do we use this? How do we make sense of it? And so um, like many of the projects, we're, we're just you know, still going and, and seeing how this can be applied. And so here what we're doing is we found an object where it would be very difficult to use a depth camera or a vision to know exactly where you should grasp this object. But there are flat surfaces that are good. And so here we're just going around palpating the object, trying to grab it. 
And eventually we see a signal that we can identify, and this is just a simple state machine. But we go around, and I'll show on the next slide um, how this works. So we, ha we get this sort of partial engagement scenario where we've just input an arbitrary threshold. And when we go past this threshold, we say, wait, we're really close. We're really close to a good grasp. And then let's just go towards the primary flow, um, sorry, the secondary flow channel direction. And it works. So we're able to do this in feedback control. OK, so I'm about to shift gears one more time. Um, but I do uh, think this is really neat. Um, and uh, we're going to stay with flow with pneumatics, and we're going to stay with tactile sensing. But now we're going to go to a more active scenario. So this case, what we're going to do is say, all right, we don't want a suction cup anymore. We just want a conventional soft robot hand. You know, suction is great, but it doesn't always work well when you have like dusty, dirty things or something muddy or whatever. So there's going to be cases where it's not suitable. Um, so here what we have is just a conventional soft robotic hand. Um, this is a bellows design. You've seen it hopefully before if you're in soft robotics. Um, and what you do is you just pump air into this bellows cham uh, chamber and it's going to bend. So what we've done is just added an extra tube. Oh, okay, off to the side, so I'll show this one first. So we've got this, these extra just like chambers. They're just sitting on the side, they're just tubes. And they're closed at the end. And then on this side we've added a whistle. This is actually called a thimble, which is the part that has the little cutout um, where you get the resonance of the airflow going up and down over this edge. And that's what generates the whistling. Um, this is like a slide whistle, like the classic kid's toy. And it is actually a slide whistle, kind of, in that it's going in and out. So you can make it so that it actually slides, or in this case, it's just a stretchy tube. Um, and you can, you know, we, we wanted to know if this very simple 1D theory could capture the trends that we see. Um, and so I will, I'll play the sound later. Um, but here you can see that we are just stretching this tube and you can get this signal. Um, and if you do sort of this characterization of the length of the tube and the frequency, you can see this relatively straightforward line, um, which is really repeatable. And then we can do the same thing with curling. So now we say, well, when we curl, that tube is going to stretch a little bit. Okay? And so um, we can now map this onto curling rather than just stretching it by hand. Um, and then you can have fun with it. I think this is like a really, a really fresh idea that has lots of room for exploration. And so what if instead of a slide whistle, you now have like a recorder and you're like, doo -doo -doo. Um, so why don't we put some holes in it? Now we can do contact sensing at specific locations that correlate to certain frequencies. So here you can see we're just raising and lowering a plate against the surface, and you get a fairly binary signal. Um, it's sensitive within one to two millimeters. Um, but, or you could send something within one to two millimeters, um, depending on your application. All right, so now I will actually play the sound to give you a sense of it. Huh? Nope. Perhaps I won't. OK. Um, it's loud. <laughs> it's like, yee! <laughs> it's just going and going and going. Um, so uh, the main takeaway is this is cool. It probably doesn't make sense around people yet. Um, you know, we're wearing earplugs when we're doing these tests. Um, but here's just an example of what you can get. So um, on the one finger, we have. Um, the bending sensor, so we're getting a sense of curvature. And on the other one, we have our contact sensor, so the recorder with the hole in it. Um, and you're able to see these signals fairly clearly in, uh, in our manipulation. Um, and now this one, uh, you also won't be able to hear, but... Oh, you can kind of hear it. Um, if it's loud, you can hear it from very, very far away. And this is our, our processing method. You know, it gets a little noisy once we get far away. <laughs> okay, so so um, so that's it. Um, we are working on one that's going to be. Uh, we've got one that's that we're working on now, which sounds much more pleasant. Um, it is musical, and you can hear it, but it is like 
uh, uh, nice, and then um, hopefully and, and hopefully play with different frequency ranges to be even more suitable around people. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it is it's just another way to transmit information, and I think this is just really a sort of a, a design exploration of like what's possible when we're not tied to using uh, wires or electrical connections only in how we transmit information. Okay, so now I wanted to move from air to land. Um, and this is going to have a lot of the similar themes, right? We're de designing systems for non-idealized physical interactions. Um, so, you know, if we start thinking about tasks where we're on the ground and we're trying to, let's say, push something or be very forceful, like this excavator, we're ultimately going to be limited by the contact conditions at our treads or our wheels. Now, for an excavator, this isn't a problem, right? Whether you're on something loose or something solid, you're just going to crush it because you're, you're so heavy. Um, but what if you're on a distant planet? What if you don't have much gravity? Or what if you're just a very, very small robot? Well, people have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and here you can see two examples in the bottom left where small robots have been uh, given grippers. So like spines for gripping onto carpet or something really uh, rough like a rock. Or maybe gecko adhesives to grip onto something very smooth and clean and flat. Well, in both these cases, you need to kind of have those surfaces available to you. And so our challenge was to think about first, can we come up with some sort of solution which is less sensitive to what we're in contact with? And then second, what about granular interaction? So not just a built environment or an environment with just clean rocks, but what about an environment that's very loose and, and dirty? And this is the project that's funded by the Early Career Faculty Award with NASA. And you can see our vision that we pitched here, where you have a system of very small robots doing a very forceful thing through tethers. Um, and our hope is that we could do something like excavation, but with very, very small robots that are much easier to send to other planets. Okay, so um, one of the systems that NASA has, um, which is super cool, is the Axel system. And it sort of goes off from another robot with a tether and then is able to do exploration. And so this sort of tethered system, I think, is very feasible for space applications. Um, and so what we have here is a small sort of analog robot. It's an open source design from another lab, um, the, the Mini R-Hex. And we've just tied a string between it and a heavier payload. And so you can see that it's able to go out, wrap its rope around on something and then pull a, a more massive load. And you can see on the left bottom that what we're looking, what we're thinking about is um, not only how this thing can go out and deploy itself, but how does it actually interact with the local media itself. So there's two main elements. Okay, but let's think about the string first. So if you have a little robot that can go out in the world and wrap its string around things, what you're getting is capstans. Okay. And we're talking about capstans and not knots, right? So to tie a knot is to sort of entangle yourself, and, and you might need a little bit more dexterity, or you might need dexterity to untangle yourself, right? So we're just thinking about wrapping it and maybe unwrapping it. And there's a couple different scenarios that we're interested in. The first one I'll show a demo of, which is to get yourself sort of unstuck or to get yourself to apply more forces as a rover. So here we've got the low traction robot and then the, the robot that needs to be more forceful. Notice that, oops, my laser pointer went away. Notice that the winch is on the heavier side. And this is really important because the capstan effect is relying on the fact that we don't really necessarily want slip to happen here. And so if we want to move this load, we're gonna to wanna to move it from that side. OK, so this is what it would look like. Um, we're in a redwood forest, which is what you find around the Berkeley campus. Um, and we have this rover that's, that's stuck on a branch or just can't do something that it needs to. And then here we have the little R-hex, mini R-hex that jumps off. And then it's going to go out in the world and try to find something to entangle itself with, or not entangle itself with, the capstan with. Um, and so here it's going to go ahead and, and navigate around this, uh, this tree that happens to be uh, right near us. And then once it's done uh, wrapping around, it's going to uh, you know, have the uh, rover winch itself forward. Now notice that it's going to actually flip over. That's okay. It's 
still works. And this is sort of trying to get away from that sort of like binary thinking of like everything needs to be perfect and predictable. Um, this project is actually an exploration of not the case, you know, and that's okay. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty cool little uh, demo there. So um, one thing that we wanted to know was how predictable is the capstan effect? Okay, so the capstan effect as it's tested usually is in a clean laboratory. You've got a nice round rod. Maybe it's temperature controlled. You know, there's a lot going on where we've controlled everything and we just want to get this sort of very idealized um, interaction like you saw on the previous slide. Um, does that work on a tree? Does that work on a rock? Like, I don't know. And so when we started this, we, we really did not know what to expect. But what you can see is for this is the median tree, this little inset. What we do is we collect a bunch of data with different wrap angles. We look at the amplification factor, and we fit a, um, the capstan equation to it, the simplified capstan equation. And it fits pretty darn well. And when we can do that over 10 redwood trees and get sort of the safety confidence as to, you know, what is the minimum that we're going to get? I think based on 10 trees near Berkeley, probably about 0.3, which is not bad, right? Now, one is, uh, there are assumptions that people make about the capstan equation, such as it's independent of the radius of the object you're capstaning around. That's not true for redwood trees, which I think intuitively makes sense. If you have a young sapling, it's going to have smooth bark. If you have a very old tree, it's going to have really rough bark. And so its coefficient of friction might reasonably be different. Um, but we do see that that's a slight uh, effort, uh, effect. So if you were in a redwood tree near Berkeley, you saw a redwood tree, or redwood forest, uh, you could be pretty sure that you're going to be OK with that, that coefficient of friction. Um, and so they ran around campus, and they did this on a bunch of random objects. It turns out that what they tested all seemed to be captured pretty well by that simplified model, which is pretty cool. So you could imagine having a library of different coefficients of friction. OK, so then one other case I just think is kind of interesting and fun is um, controlling a load. So I think oftentimes we're thinking about this kind of a, a, um, mechanism being useful in multi-robot systems because you can trade off roles. But what could you do with a single agent? Well, maybe controlled um, payload deployment. So here you can see a very lightweight robot deploying a much heavier load, both um, allowing and then arresting motion um, as it sees, sees fit. OK, and then you know, you'd even have more robots. I'm not going to spend time on this. But um, you know, it was one of the things that I think has been kind of interesting as we've gone into this is the capstan effect is not new. <laughs> um, it's been used in construction for a really long time, potentially as early as ancient Egypt. Um, and so we're not inventing this uh, by any means. But when we look at robotic systems in the field, uh, tether contact with the world is almost always referenced in, in terms of a challenge and something that should be avoided. And so this is really just a piece of work that is supposed to reframe the problem of tether world contact as, as a great advantage and something that makes you almost completely insensitive to whether you're on leaves or on gravel or whatever. It's just as long as you have some traction and enough wrapping, you can do what you want. Um, now, one important thing to note is that you will be limited by the strength of the object you're capstanding around. So if you capstan around a tiny little pebble, <laughs> that's the maximum force you're going to be able to hold. And so it does create these interesting planning and deployment problems in terms of predicting the strength of objects in the environment. The other thing that we're noticing as we play with this idea is there's a lot of power to the partial capstan. So in the past, you might have a system like this where you want to wrap just on one object and you want to kind of control that contact um, angle really well. When you're deploying in the field, it's adv advantageous to only do a partial wrap because then you don't entangle yourself and it's now a more reversible system. So you can deploy it and redeploy it as much as you want. Um, we also think there's advantages to harnessing multiple objects that you can use weaker objects and harness them together to do more forceful things. So like using small stones like this. Um, for the sake of time, I won't show this video, um, but it does uh, a, re a reversible maneuver. And now, OK, we've got the tether. Makes a lot of sense. What about the object and what about the robot? 
So we're doing things like pulling objects in sand and trying to understand how much force they can withstand, how their force changes as they mound or create um, other sort of uh, shapes in the sand around them. Um, and you know, you just have this great potential for amplification. Okay. So to finish up today, I want to, to talk about granular interaction. And so in this diagram here, you can see that we have this capstan effect and maybe we could wrap this tether. But we need to think about these distal agents. And here's the equation where we have the amplification factor. And this is the force that we're able to apply on the forceful side and then the input force on the small robot side. So I want to focus in on this input um, tension. The more we can make that greater, even if it goes from one newton to two newtons, that's doubling the output force that we could get. So with the capstan effect, you get this sort of really nice exponential improvement in performance, even if you just increase your TO by a little bit. So we really want to do that well. And that's like having the R hex dig its legs down into the ground. OK, so we need to be able to understand what forces are applied and design these systems to apply more. So as we started going into granular media, we wanted to know, well, what tools are available for us to simulate many different designs or understand what's going on? Um, granular media is a surprisingly unintuitive uh, media. It, it took me a while to start to get more of a sense of it. And ultimately, it's not like being underwater where you, know, you kind of have constant drag. If you have a body that's going sideways underground, it's going to want to work its way out. Um, so you get these anisotropic effects, um, which just make it very difficult to interact with. So what tools are there? On the left-hand side, you can see discrete element method, which is you literally model every grain of sand. As you can imagine, these could take many, many hours, if not days or weeks, to run a single circumstance, depending on the complexity of your system. On the other side of things, so that would be very, very accurate, but take a long time. On the other side, we have a less robust or less accurate method, but this is a closed form calculation. And so it's an empirical method called resistive force theory. You take bodies or plates, you shove them into sand, you measure how much resistance that has, and then you map that onto other bodies. As a closed form calculation, it's very, very fast. This is a tool that's been around for a while and mostly applied to robotics because of the need for fast parametric study of designs and control strategies. Um, but in the past, it's been simplified to 2D. And why is that? Because it takes a long time to shove objects in the ground <laughs> and measure those forces. And then if you change the media that you're in or you change you know, something about the, the environment, you need to do it again. So it's, it is this kind of difficult time, uh, time analysis. For, for design. So what we wanted to do was try to map this onto 3D circumstances without much more effort or <laughs> problem. And so um, what we want to do is, is take our plate, put it in sand, map it onto 3D objects now, and, um, and be able to compute the forces as an object moves around. Um, so this was the first contribution from uh, Laura on the right-hand side. So the left-hand side is the conventional way that people do this. There's two parametric, um, two parameters that you um, have then are, are a function of these two parameters, gamma and beta, which have to do with the velocity and the orientation of the plate. What we did is we added the velocity out of the plane that was previously modeled um, and came up with some cool simplifications. All right. If you're doing granular media, check it out. We made this open source. We're happy to talk with you. I won't go into much more detail, but it is, it's nice work. <laughs> OK, um, and the punchline is, hey, it models things pretty well. So here we have a 3D object taking a 3D trajectory into round glass beads, which does simplify the problem. But here we can see the model and experiments in the dashed and the solid lines matching pretty well. And there's various hypotheses that have been thrown out that you know, roots take this, what's called circumutation. There's some energy benefit. We did not find an energy benefit with this method. OK. Um, and then to go for another type of bioinspiration, mole crabs. These are Pacific mole crabs. You can find them on the California coast. One of the fastest burrowers in body lengths. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they're just they're super cool, and they, they burrow really well. And so we took a 3D object and are able to model the forces experienced. You can see, once again, the dashed line, the, the uh, model matching very well with the experiments. OK, so we want, ultimately, a robot that can burrow down on the ground, 
to be able to withstand larger forces. So let's try to look a little bit more at this mole crab and design something like it. So this is Ember, the Emerita burrowing robot. Emerita is the like biological name for the animal. Um, and we have some cool design features. This paper has been accepted and it should be coming out, I'm guessing in a matter of a week or two, hopefully. Um, so you will be able to, to see the details soon. Um, but it has these kind of cool features. One fun thing is a cuticle. When you have an exoskeleton, you have joints, you need to keep the grains and the dirt and the mud out. These uh, arthropods also have cuticles in between their segments. So we also found that was very important so that sand wouldn't get into our mechanism. Um, and this is it burrowing. So you can see that we're doing motion tracking and it's actually able to uh, move itself downward. Now, if you haven't worked in granular media before, you might not recognize how difficult this is. If it's about this big, if you were to take something about that size and just like shove it in, you would have to be like, you know, working, okay? It's not just like, you know, you'd have to like put some muscle into it. Um, and this is the very first time that a legged robot has been able to burrow itself downward. They've burrowed sideways a lot, they've burrowed out, but this is gonna be the first time burrowing down. So um, we felt really, really good about this. Um, okay, but you know, we're designers, right? And so we wanna try to understand how it works and to create tools for other designers to apply this to their own systems. And so we applied resistive force theory to the motion of the legs to predict the forces. You can see in some circumstances we do well, in others we don't. But is this still a useful model? So we did parametric studies using this. Again, this can be computed really fast. Um, and so in this top case, I'm showing you what I would call a design parametric study. We're looking at different metrics that we think are gonna tell us whether something's gonna be able to go downward. Um, and what we're doing is varying the, um, this is the leg angle. So you can see uh, gamma equals zero and gamma equals 100 is the design of where that leg is placed. And the star right here and right here is the robot that actually was able to dig. And you can see that we're getting near this minimum and near this maximum value through design work in our lab. Um, and uh, so that was, that was really cool. Um, and then this is a controller, a control study, where what we're doing is changing the phase offset between the legs. So do they go together or do, does one lead the other? And you can see, once again, our design is near the minimum and maximum that we are uh, modeling, which was, once again, very cool. Um, and this is just a quick review to point out that um, these are basically all the robots we were able to find that were able to move downward themselves, like move the whole body downward. And um, there's only one other one that uses kind of fin-like movements and excavation, but ours is the, is, the one, is the only one that uses legs in the most conventional sense. Um, this is just, once again, a reminder that RFT is open uh, sourced. I think it's very powerful. Um, we've, we've done some cool studies on thinking about, you know, how much um, um, discretization you need. So definitely check it out if you are interested in this. All right, so that is the end of the project. Um, so this is just to su sort of summarize my key takeaway, which is that I think if we if we allow ourselves to not just think about the kinematics of our robots, the compliance of our robots, but actually think about just like the contact itself and the physics of the environment that we are in, I think we're gonna find plenty of opportunities for innovation um, and just thinking about problems differently. And so, um, and also just another note here that because we are sensitive to contact conditions, if we can change them just 10%, 20%, it might have a really dramatic outcome on the behavior of our system. So very small actuators might be able to have a really big impact. Um, now, I know I'm pretty much out of time. I just wanted to just shout out um, to my students who do work on the other side of the lab. About a third of the lab works with human subjects and works on like wearable assistive technologies and things about human touch. And so I just, in case you are in this field, I want you to know this is out there. And the theme here has to do with 
understanding the person, right? So you see a theme even emerging across these applications. We want to know the abilities of that person and not just assume the robot needs to replace everything that they could do. So we're really thinking about body actuation and how the robot can make small changes to that system to make a really big impact in people's lives. Um, so just really quick, we've got a variable. We're thinking about variable transmissions in wearable devices. And so the person is doing most of the actuation, but the variable transmission, it's changing the person's relationship to the grasp. And we're finding this to be m most useful when somebody needs to grasp many different types of objects, not just one type of object. We've got a couple devices that do what I call shared grasping or collaborative grasping, where once again, we're relying on the person to be a participant in grasping. Let's say somebody who has paralyzed fingers but can extend the wrist, maybe they can grasp with the back of their hand and they're applying um, counteracting forces to the grasp. And so the robot is just there to enhance what's possible. Um, and then finally, this is the first journal paper. So, you know, we, we got our first IRB human subjects approval in 2019, and now we have six. And so this has grown during the pandemic, which has slowed it. But this stuff should come out in, in journal version soon, hopefully this year. Um, but this one we did submit to, to transactions on haptics, and we found a correlation between basically somebody's ability to measure vibrations on their phone and a clinically relevant um, skin sensitivity test. And so potentially you could do diagnostics or track skin sensation um, outside of clinical settings. Okay, well with that, I will now pause and take questions. Um, and yeah, looking forward to hearing what you got. All right, so uh, I want, we want to thank you for coming all the way uh, across the entire country. And so this is uh, a present oh, for you. That's fantastic. Uh, it has uh, essentially zero embodied dexterity. It's <laughs> a, uh, a hard turtle, uh, which is our mascot, the Terrapin Turtle. Oh, thank, thank you, you so, much. so much for coming. That's so nice. I'll, uh, I'll get some inspiration from the turtle now. <laughs> 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 so, all right, so we are going to open up the floor for questions. Any questions from the live audience? And I'm going to be checking my phone to see anyone from, uh, it's actually broadcast Zoom live as well. So I'll also be checking to see if anyone over. All right, yeah. Will this PowerPoint be posted at all? Is there any possibility to post it? Uh, I don't think the PowerPoint is going to be For what purpose? I mean, the, uh, the, lecture, or the talk is recorded. Oh. And, and if you're interested in seeing just like our list of citations or like a specific citation, they're all on this website, edg.berkeley.edu. Mm -hmm. uh, any other? Yeah. System, although it was kind of noisy. Uh, can you, did you, did you try to um, use this kind of system to estimate the configuration of robot finger? Configuration? Do you mean like pose or? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there was a plot where it showed sort of the curvature. Um, we are able to get a good estimate of curvature. Now, when it becomes in contact, you get now more complex deformations. So I think this type of modality, sort of a sensitive structure, or like a structure that is complexly linked to sound in some way, I think what it lends itself to is having, let's say, four, th maybe three or four chambers, um, and then doing machine learning to map that very, so then you just need to load your finger in many different ways, gather that complex data set, and I think it's like, it's like perfect for that kind of application. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And Great I applaud you for holding back from the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang reference. What, uh, what's that? Oh, uh, too sweet? Have, no, uh, I don't know. I will send it to you okay, after. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, a classic. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey, question? So, um, <coughs> you mentioned like the example of people with, um, Thing, wrinkling fingers when yeah. they're working in water, right? Yeah. Um, so, but I'm curious, like in your work on grip, uh, grasping, have you developed or tested any designs that are deliberately changing that skin to um, improve functionality or performance? I think that's a fantastic idea. I have n not. Researchers have. So there have been quite a few like um, actuated, like 
actively actuated. So it might be like a rubbery skin with channels in it and then like or something rigid could poke out or like spines or something like that could poke out of that surface. So under different conditions. Well, it could be passive. Some people have done that. A passive or active, yes. Um, I would say I would love to see more researchers doing that. I think it's an underutilized space. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you can even imagine like if you want to just maximize stickiness in a dry circumstance, you want flat. If you want to, yeah, so you could imagine having something that's actually morphine. Okay. That'd be cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Nice. So, so uh, in the suction, Yeah, so we, we had this debate when we were first doing it. Um, you could put it in the palm. The, the thing that we ended up deciding on the fingertip for was that the distances we were measuring were so small that you needed the object to get like kind of close to the to the suction orifice in order to have a strong effect. Um, and so, you know, for, if an object is getting close to the palm, there's a good chance you could just wrap your fingers around. We never actually did a formal exploration of that. We just said, this is our assumption. We're going to put it on the fingertips. Um, I'm, I'm, maybe there's, there would be a cool case for expanding location. Yeah. Because what I see is the object is sticking to that suction, mm -hmm. and then the thing is closing. The yeah. Yeah, we never really did much of a uh, feedback coordination, so we didn't implement. This is kind of more like a um, teleoperated situation where we're kind of just like watching what's going on and sort of making decisions as if we're teleoperating a robot. Um, I think it would be make a lot of sense to to use that signal you're getting in feedback control to have a much more sort of natural uh, system behavior. Um, yeah, I think I think it would be a natural next step. Great. All right. So I'm going to wrap up. We have like 40 seconds left. But um, let's give our speaker another round of applause. Thank you so much for